Hello to everyone. Good evening. I am Nellie Herman. Um, I am will be your host tonight. Um, I'm the creative director of the Narrative Medicine Program. Um, you've probably seen me on previous rounds. On behalf of the Division of Narrative Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, I welcome all of you, especially those who are joining rounds for the first time, and welcome back all of you who are coming back to us. Narrative Medicine arose at Columbia in 2001 and is now an international movement at the intersection of humanities, the arts, clinical practice, and healthcare justice. Narrative training equips clinicians to humbly try to comprehend their patients' experiences and perspectives so as to deliver equitable and effective healthcare. Rigorous training and practice of narrative medicine helps all those interested in person-centered, respectful healthcare to deepen their self-awareness, clinical attunement, collaborative <coughs> skills, uh-oh, I apologize for my dog, and creative capacities. Our commitments to healthcare justice underlie our writing, teaching, research, advocacy, and delivery of care. The narrative medicine community assembles monthly here at Rounds to grow our knowledge, partnership, and commitment to a just and effective healthcare future. So before I introduce our wonderful speaker for tonight, I have been asked, I'm gonna just mention a couple basic Zoom things. Everybody's very familiar with Zoom already these days, but still warrants a quick, um, quick note. Please keep your microphones muted um, to cut down on background noise. Be forewarned if there are any disruptions or inappropriate comments in the chat, you may be removed from the event. Um, during the talk itself, during the presentation, we ask people to keep the chat interactions to a minimum. As we get closer to the Q&A part of the event, um, we will invite you to submit questions for Sarah via the chat. Um, but before then, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Um, before then, um, we won't necessarily be looking at the chat. So just, you know, be warned that we might not see your questions if you put them in early. Um, the event is being recorded. Everyone who registered for the event will get a, a link to the recording a day or two afterward, and you can share that as you wish. Um, captioning and ASL interpreters will be available during tonight's event. Um, and at the end, we'll have a link to online bookstore to order books or find out informa more information about Sarah and about the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics and the program in narrative medicine. Um, okay, I am now gonna introduce Sarah. Let me pull up my other note. Um, so Sarah Novich, I'm very, um, very excited to have her here tonight. We go back many, many years. She um, did her MFA at Columbia. I was trying just before the event to, to recall exactly when we first met and how, and I, all I do remember is that I, for some reason, I don't know if I, I can't remember and neither can Sarah if, if I was one of her thesis readers or why I encountered her work, I don't remember, but I did encounter her work while she was still a student and I remember just being, you know, really blown away by her and her writing and saying, I need to know this per person. And then we did get to know each other and she um, taught with me. She taught applied writing in the narrative medicine program with me, I think like eight years ago now. Um, so really has been a long time narrative medicine colleague and I've been following her work with such admiration since then. Um, I'm very excited to have her back to the community. Um, so in addition, just, you know, uh, official, the official intro, in addition to her New York Times bestseller, True Biz, which we will speak about tonight, she is the author of America is Immigrants and of the acclaimed novel, Girl at War, which won the American Library Association's Alex Award and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. She is an instructor of deaf studies and creative writing, and she lives in Philadelphia with her family. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nelly. And thank you everybody for coming tonight and joining in this conversation as part of narrative medicine. I think it's a really important gathering and an area of study. I'm so happy to be a part of it. 
So I think I should start by plugging in my computer. Okay, there, that was good. I have some slides that I'd like to share and uh, to support my thinking and sharing my thoughts about this uh, in conjunction with narrative medicine. And then after that, uh, we can talk more broadly with Nellie and all of you. Can everybody see the slides? Is that all right? Everybody seeing it? Okay. All right. So often when people talk about deaf culture, about deaf people, about deaf community, we also hear people say something called deaf awareness. This past September, for example, was Deaf Awareness Month. And it's awesome. People all over the world learn about deaf culture, learn about the community, share experiences, learn about sign language. But after that, where are we? Then what happens? So some information is shared and what do we do with it? I'm interested in that. What happens after awareness? So now you know some deaf people and you've met me, I'm here. <laughs> well, are we real? Where are we? Yes. Okay, so what happens next after you've had that awareness? I think next, the next step is acceptance. But what does acceptance mean? I think it's a big reframing, especially for people that are in the medical field. I think instead of trying to fix something, the next step is to stop and think about what acceptance might mean. To think about deafness as part of diversity instead of something that needs to be cured or eliminated from our genetic uh, family of genes. I have other tips that I typically share with my students in deaf studies when I'm teaching. Many of them go into education or go into fields of healthcare or other fields of study. And we talk a lot about getting the information, but the next step is what do we do with the information we get? A really big issue for me is not to conflate having more with better, that idea. So if the majority, if you're a part of that, it does not mean that you're better or superior to other people. I think many people confuse that and think that deaf people that can lip read or use their voice are better. And that's because the majority of people use their voice to speak. But they're really two different things. So the, the majority is not always superior. It doesn't mean that you're better. So I think that's something to think about. 
So I think for deaf and people with disabilities in general, I think that whether we hear or not, I think it's more important to listen to us when we share our thoughts. And the other thing I think people confuse deafness with is not being intelligent because it's a different way of communicating. And therefore people think it's less than, or it's not as good as. But if you will stop and listen to us talk about our experiences, you might see, first of all, that we are the same as all of you. <laughs> We're human. Secondly, that we have values that we share together, all of us. And I will touch on that some more later with another slide. The other thing, and I think this is an easy one, is to think about the way that you use your words, your language. And in narrative medicine, that's a really important idea, right? How we use language, how we're speaking to each other. So the list that you're seeing here is really easy. To refer to someone as deaf or hard of hearing, to talk about a hearing loss, that's fine. They're a disabled person. They're a person with a, a disability. That's fine. But things that you want to avoid is saying, oh, they suffer from whatever it is. I see that so much in the writing and other people. Oh, they suffer from a hearing loss, right? Well, how do you know they're suffering from that? You know, how does one actually judge that? or even the use of hearing impaired. I would question why would you want to identify something with the one thing they're not doing, they're not hearing? Why does that become their identity? I don't label you as a signing impaired person because you don't know sign language. So why is there a negative label then attached to a deaf person? as hearing impaired. And you see that and that label can set up a negative expectation in the communication right away. It's a negative labeling. It's, and if that's in your frame set, your mindset, it's affecting you. And then the last uh, thing, the words that you see on the slide, special needs or differently abled or handicapable. I caution you not to. I think they're gross. <laughs> I think they're so gross. And I say that because it, you, it seems like we need to be hidden. There's something about it that you don't want to confront. So it's something so wrong that you can't even say the words deaf. So I offer this as food for thought to everyone. The next step after acceptance, I think, is understanding. So what's the difference between acceptance and understanding? Well, I thought a lot about the difference between the medical perspective and the cultural perspective on deaf culture. And I'm sure you all have thought about all these things as well, the medical perspective. So this slide shows you a breakdown in the way to these perspectives might look at a deaf person and, and their culture. Typically in the medical field, when a deaf person walks into a doctor's office, it's not so comfortable. And it's not so comfortable because first of all, we had to get an interpreter to, to accompany us or to be in the room. And 
some of the worst people or the biggest fights are that doctors resist providing interpreters. It's always a place for me where it's really hard for someone to say, okay, I'll get an interpreter. That's a big fight. And that's a place where we really need that ease of communication the most. Because if there's a communication breakdown right there, it could be really dangerous. And this attitude is the reason why so many deaf people are so uncomfortable in the medical arena. Many deaf people avoid going to the doctor. Many deaf people tend to, they take more time when they go to ER because they have delayed going to the doctor for so long that then they have to go to the ER. And the reason here again is because of this medical perspective, it's really hard to get someone or to have to meet someone who is always looking down on you, who always thinks that something broken is broken about you, that something needs to be fixed. So the chart that you're looking at, I think helps to show you it's a, there's a, a really different way of looking at a deaf person. And I think if you understand this, there can be a much more collaborative approach when working with a deaf person. I'm not suggesting that you have to pick one over the other, but you can think about these things cohabitating. It is possible to be, have a disability and have a cultural perspective and have a culture. It is. So this slide is, what do we mean when we say deaf culture? You know, most people wonder like, what does that mean when you say you have a culture? So we know culture encompasses so many things. It encompasses language, our traditions, our practices, our spaces, our values, our experiences. Deaf people have all of that. The reason why I think it might be difficult for some people to understand is because it's not past down in the way that maybe other families pass down their cultures, typically. Typically, your family is where you get your culture. It comes from your parents, your grandparents, those traditions, they're passed down. But deaf people are passing it sort of horizontally. They're sharing it from side to side with each other. And that is a different way of sharing, perhaps, the culture but it does not mean that there's no culture there. In some ways you might see it as a parallel to the queer experience where someone in a family might not be having those traditions passed down from their parents. They're finding their culture, the queer culture, from each other. So you might be able to uh, envision the similar analogy, a parallel there. So awareness, accept, uh, understanding, acceptance, understanding, and then value. Can you find value in being deaf or in the deaf culture? Within the deaf community, we have, we talk about deaf gain, that idea. And perhaps it's a little bit of a joke because it's the opposite of hearing loss, right? 
which is what's a common thing that everybody knows, we've coined deaf gain. But really, I would say it's a true thing. It's a real thing in my life. It means being deaf as a person has made me a better writer. And I will show you how. So one of the things that deaf gain means is that we are natural problem solvers. We, use, we approach problems with creativity because every time we go out into the, I step out of my house and have to interact with the hearing world at large and hearing people, I have to immediately find ways to solve problems in communication. And hearing people become quite scared when they interact with me. They're not helping me typically. So deaf people do a lot of problem solving here. We're very good at finding creative ways to communicate with people. The other thing is that we're bilingual and bilingualism in general is a really good thing. I think that's a value for me as a writer because it helps me make connections in different ways around the world. I'm able to take on different perspectives. The third one is a visual thinker. As a visual, I'm a visual thinker. And for me, when I sit down to write, I am envisioning those places in space. And that helps me to, as I write the words in, uh, write the words out. And I made my book, I hope, a more visual experience that makes it more enjoyable for the reader as well. So in my book, True Biz, it is about the deaf community. And as a visual thinker and in creating this book, I think it helped me all the time, actually in whatever book I'm writing, but in this particular book, it was really important because I had to devise a way to show the reader the deaf experience and the signing experience on paper. So for me, that was a really big challenge in writing this book. ASL, American Sign Language, is a three-dimensional language. And to try to devise a way to put it in a two-dimensional page was, was really challenging. I did a lot of bad experimenting. <laughs> so, and you can see on the left of the slide, these are my notes where I was just brainstorming all different ways to produce sign language on paper. First, I thought of the obvious answer, right? I'm going to use ASL words and show you the different word order that it's written in because ASL typically has a very different word order than English and many times it can be confusing to English speakers. So I started that way with, a, I, with the ASL dialogue thinking, okay, I will, and I use the word gloss to just be able to do a direct choice of English words to show people what the ASL looked like. And that was problematic because I thought hearing people reading that will perceive it as simply broken English. And I didn't want that. So then I thought I'll try again. So for the deaf characters, 
ASL is not broken English. It is actually better language, more clear than English. So how could I convey that to the reader? So then I started experimenting with different ways. So you can see that on the left side of the slide, I drew a person's head. And I was thinking about how would I use that? How can I show the sentence where the signs are placed on the body? Because ASL is a 3D language and it uses the whole space of our body. And so that didn't work. I thought that's not working on paper to communicate what I want. So finally, I arrived at the way the dialogue is displayed in the book. I wanted it to use space the same way that we do when we are signing to each other. the way that we sign in our conversations. So if I'm telling you a story and I'm setting, I set up something in space. As you see, I'm holding up one finger right now. I might set up another finger and those are two people that are talking to each other if I'm telling you about that. And you as the listener to me would understand if I reflect, use directionality even, and I take something from the left side and move it over to the right side. People that know ASL understand this kind of communication. So I was wanted to show that use of space on the page where each character could have their own place on the page as they were speaking. And in the end, I think that worked. I think that it felt to me that it was giving an idea to people how important the use of space is in American Sign Language. And also gives people a different experience, something that they're not used to seeing in print. And for me, that is deaf gain. That is giving hearing people something new to think about. And if we think about deaf gain in general, it's not just about writing. There are actually other gains for deaf people as well across fields. We are more aware of space we use our peripheral vision and take advantage of it better than other people. We typically have quicker response and reaction times if something unexpected is happening. We are very responsive that way. We have strong communication skills. Language barriers are not going to interfere. You know, we confront that and work through that. And we're sensitive to nonverbal communication information that people are giving. And again, as I've said, we, are, we have a problem-solving mindset. That's how we deal with the world that's hearing. So these are just some examples of values that I think are in the deaf experience and deaf community. And I tried to infuse my characters that were deaf with these benefits. And I offer it to you because, you know, as I was writing this book and thought about the deaf characters I was seeing on television or what we typically saw, they're typically presented as isolated, maybe depressed, lonely. I really wanted this book to show the vibrancy of the deaf community, the joys that are part of our lives. The wonderful things that pop up in the deaf world and that we respond to just as everybody does. So 
I'm happy to talk more in depth about the book or about any questions that anyone might have. I think Nellie is going to start by joining with some questions and then we'll open it up to all of you. Is that right? So I'm going to stop my slide share at this point. Thank you, Sarah. So wonderful. Thank you. That was just great. Um, yes, I will. Um, I will ask a couple of my questions, um, but those of you in the audience, um, I will invite you to put your questions. You can start to put your questions in the chat if you wish. And then um, after I talk with Sarah a little bit, we will um, we will get to your questions. So um, yeah, I mean, Sarah, you just, I mean, I one of my questions was, I wanted to talk about the dialogue in the book, which was so interesting and I, definitely have never seen language represented in so many different ways um, on the page. And yes, you didn't even mention, I mean, a whole other aspect. You had the, of course, the actual representation of the dialogue when people are speaking, but you also have a whole other aspect, which is essentially a whole course. You know, you have all the because this the for those who haven't read the book the book involves a school um a deaf school so you you also sort of embed all these lesson plans in the book which are lesson plans for me um you know i learned so much about asl through those lesson plans which um and anyway this is getting to my other question i'm not going to ask you any more about the dialogue because you just so beautifully told us about all of that. But it does get to my my biggest question that I wanted to talk with you about, um, which is related to the lesson plans. Um, that, you know, reading this book, I just was so, it, it was such an interesting experience because on the one hand, the book is, you know, just a, a, a straightforward page turner, you know, just a very compelling story with great characters, you know, all the things you want from a novel. And on the other hand, or maybe I shouldn't, I don't mean to put them against each other, but it's also very clearly, you know, you're making an argument. You're very, it's clear that you have quote unquote, an agenda that you're, that you're putting in your book. Um, and as a writer, I was so curious. I'm just so like, how do you, how do you stay, how do you write a story that's, that's compelling and, you know, works as a novel and also be working with that other part of you that wants to educate, you know, to change minds, to bring more justice, all the things. Um, how do you do that without making the book into some kind of polemic, which won't be, which will turn people off from reading it. I don't know if there's an answer, but that was a lot of what I was thinking about while I was reading it. Mm. I'm happy you felt that way <laughs> because that, that was a real challenge for me in writing this book. In general, I mean, not always, but it, it, it's, not always wanting to make a point, but yes, deciding how much I wanted to educate. Because it's really, I mean, most people really don't know very much about the deaf world, the deaf community. And writing this book, I had to struggle with how much information I needed to give to be able to tell my story. You know, I wanted my story to make sense to everybody. So, yes, it was searching for that balance. And when I started, I felt a lot of resistance inside myself because I didn't want to have to educate everybody. You know, I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't want, you know, some like someone to feel like there's an old white man sitting there like preaching at them, right? <laughs> uh, 
But at the same time, I felt like if I don't get this information, you're not going to have empathy with the characters that I'm writing about. So I really had to prioritize for myself empathy. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to empathize with these characters. And with that goal, that led me. I, they were interesting characters. And so I then had to decide how much information I needed to offer in order to be supportive of my characters. Because I really wanted people to see these people, see themselves in the characters, whether or not you're deaf or hearing, you can identify with these characters. And I think that then makes it more powerful and makes my point more powerful about experience the world as a deaf, experiencing the world as a deaf person. Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. Um, and then I think that you, you're articulating part of what is really cool about it for as a reader, because you're, as a reader, you're you're kind of on the journey that the characters are also on. Um, so, you know, for example, your character Charlie is learning ASL. So you're, the, the reader is learning along with the character in a way that makes you feel, you the reader feel like, oh, this is just part of this book. Like I'm not, it doesn't feel like, oh, Sarah's trying to tell me about ASL. Um, I mean, you are, but that that was what I found so, it just, it was, I, I, you know, knowing what I know about writing books, I was like, this is hard to do, um, to, to put that much information, real, like real information. I learned a lot from this book, um, but it also was like, uh, I was in, engaged in the story and I know that that must have been really hard to do. So impressed. Um, and those, you know, also there's all kinds of histories you put all, you know, it's not just the language of ASL, there's all kinds of history that I didn't know about, you know, just deaf history and the, the long trajectory of, anyway, I won't, it's just, a, yes, I was impressed with all the things that you were doing there. Um, and I will ask just one more question, which is along the same lines before I invite folks from the audience to ask questions, but I don't know, I'm just curious if you, what you would say, I mean, really along the same lines, but like what, as artists, as writers, um, as people who care about art, you know, how do we think about what, what art can, what, what can art do? I mean, I think your book is an example of what art can do um, in terms of like educating people without their necessarily knowing they're being <laughs> educated, but you know, you were speaking before about um, moving beyond awareness. And I was just thinking to myself like, yeah, okay, so how does writing or art making play a role in that or can it? I don't know, but I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I started writing this book because I read a newspaper article about a company uh, that made cochlear implants and they were making defective implants and continued to market them. So engineers told them they should stop but they did not stop marketing them. So people were truly getting hurt. And that in the book is the way Charlie gets hurt, the character. So when I read that article, I, I was shocked because I thought of myself, right? I'm always paying attention to things that are happening in the deaf world and I had never heard that story. And I thought, why don't I know this happened? So that was, that got me thinking, right? What can I do about this? How can I respond as an artist? 
I could, I could write something. It could be fiction. I could write more articles, but there's, but I thought people really need to know what this feels like. What the, this is more than just understanding a fact, reading an article about something that's defective. What does this really feel like on the human level? So that was the beginning to me, the beginning question for me. So yes, as an artist I, and the arts, I hope that it's a way to make people angry, I hope, to respond. Uh, yeah, I want people to feel something because people can have all the facts in the world and then it doesn't matter if we don't do something about it or we don't take responsibility for it. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if it worked. No, but I think you- But I hope so. Yeah, no, and I think you're articulating, I mean, at least for us as fiction writers, I do think that that's a lot of what fiction can do, hopefully. I mean, you need to have readers, which is the hard part, but if you do have readers, that the, hopefully what you can do with fiction is make people feel what something feels like from the inside as much as that's possible. Um, and I think, in, yeah, that, that is what what's wonderful about your book and the way that it, it, it works. Um, well, I, I do see one question in the chat so far, but I hope audience, you might put some more questions there if you have them. I mean, I can keep talking to Sarah if you don't. Um, uh, oh, what another person wrote, just wrote a question, I mistakenly as a direct message to me, but I got it so I can ask it to you. Um, um, well, uh, the first question that came in um, is in, and um, by the way, for those of you putting your questions in, I'm just gonna read them out. I'm gonna read them out. I hope that's all right. Um, uh, in 1967, the National Theater of the Deaf was founded under the umbrella of the Eugene O'Neill Memorial Theater Center in Waterford, Connecticut. 55 years on, will you share your perspective on how the integration of sign language as a performing arts language on world stages transformed the perception of every deaf individual? That's a big question there. Um. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting time that we're living in now. And as you said right now, we are making baby steps, I feel, right? We are inching our way forward every time the hearing world sees signing on the stage, in a book, in a film. So many hearing people fall in love with sign language right away. But now I think the next step has to be to make the connection between loving sign language, it's so beautiful, and valuing deaf people, valuing the community that makes the sign language happen. Recognizing that place. And I think deaf people are still finding their place today. So I hope that every time hearing people are exposed to sign language, that yes, they do fall in love with it. And that they fall in love with deaf people too. And yet I ask again, and then what? What is next? Very good answer, well done. Um, all right, the next question came to me in a, in a direct message. Um, thank you so much for these incredible insights. I truly appreciate it. I'm curious how deaf gain may change or deepen one's experience of poetry. 
Oh, that's a good question. I am not a poet, but ASL poetry is amazing. Poetry in ASL does things that English could never do. Um, it's with, with really, I mean, it can be, res it, we can set up constraints. We can be using just the alphabet, the hand shapes of the alphabet in American Sign Language and create stories and visual experiences that blow your mind. ASL poets, I think, are some of the most talented people out there. But in, but also, in, when you think of writing in English, yes, their their poetry is wonderful in written English as well. Uh, I think that there's a. I have a different connection to English language. You know, some people may have the connection. It's their second language. You know, it changes the way you experience it then. When, so when you have that connection with ASL, you have an experience with ASL in its own form. And I think that using English as a second language Maybe you do things that a person who speaks English natively wouldn't think of doing. And that's probably true in general. I think that's, you know, it's true for deaf people, but it's true for people as well who speak other languages. Thank you. Um, we have someone who wants to ask a question in ASL. So Sierra, yeah, there you are. Okay, great. Hi. I, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm wondering if you have how, how you could support deaf artists, um, artists like yourself, because there are other deaf artists around the world. Um, and also in the medical field, um, I, I advocate for a deaf staff. I'm a professional here. And what advice would you give us for providing support for the deaf staff in this field? I think the most important thing I would that hearing people can do for deaf people or staff members is to think about accessibility first, not accessibility as a thing that has to be added on later. Because if you have to add something later, the accessibility later, I, I think it always ends up being worse. Deaf people are left begging for what they need. They're pleading for an interpreter or whatever other accommodation that they need. And, Deaf people are required to make all this extra effort. And that's not what everybody else does. It's not fair. So I think if you have the ability to make the space equitable from the start, then I think deaf people can be fully involved and they can also tell you what they need themselves without feeling this huge responsibility. Yeah, thank you. That was a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Um, all right, we, I mean, I only see two more, so maybe we could get to both of them. Um, um, okay, first one is fascinating information about what's beyond awareness. 
I had not considered the medical perspective to be so work to fix and normality is needed to reintegrate into society before this presentation. Would it be more valuable to work toward adapting a cultural perspective when writing medical narratives versus a medical perspective? How would a writer bridge these two perspectives depending on patient experiences or the cultural understanding of a particular disability, especially if evidence-based health recommendations and amplifying underrepresented patient voices are goals for the writer? Another large question. Yes, that is a big one. Uh, yeah, not so easy. Yes. Again, I mean, so there are so many different kinds of deaf experiences that people have. You can't point to one more than the other. In the medical field, I think the medical perspective has been what's been dominant. And so it's important to address that. And I think the important part for the medical field is to offer assistive technology, offer the different kinds of things, and at the same time, respect the person that's in front of you. And both can happen, I believe and both don't happen most of the time, but both can happen. So it is okay to bring resources and tools that the deaf without to the deaf person without being patronizing, without looking down upon them, with being disrespectful. That doesn't have to happen. It is okay for deaf people to turn down those offers as well. We have a visitor. All right, yeah, I have a visitor. <laughs> this is uh, my deaf son. And this is a good example because it's really hard to bring him to the doctor. People look down on me, people look down on him, on both of us. And it, it is really a challenge. And I don't respond to that as a mother. I, I don't like talking over his head. I don't like people that try to do that. So it's a real, it's a really tough situation. So I think Remembering to respect and be respectful during the process as well. Yep. Um, we have now more questions and I also realize I missed one um, that I'm gonna ask, but maybe we can just go a couple minutes over because some of these questions are really, really beautiful and deserve to be asked. I realize every, I, I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them. So I apologize in advance to all of you who are asking these great questions. Um, but the one I missed is, um, wait, where did it go? Uh, here it is. You captured so beautifully Charlie's experience. I'm curious if you interviewed people who had defective implants. Yes, yes, I did interview several people and there was a variety of experiences they reported. Some people liked having a cochlear implant. Some people, uh, gave me the information without me asking and said it was a mixed experience. Some people hated the experience of hearing through a cochlear implant. They found it very painful. Uh, there would be bleeding at the spot, a lot of negative experiences. Uh, so there were, there were some positive experiences as well. I, I interviewed many deaf people uh, for different parts of the book. So it wasn't only for the character of Charlie, but I also wanted to interview people that experienced, experienced growing up attending a residential school for the deaf because that was not my experience. I grew up uh, 
like the character of Charlie attending a mainstream uh, school experience. So, and I don't have a cochlear implant. So, but I did experience the feeling of being isolated. I'm also uh, experienced coming late to the deaf community and uh, my experience of what that was going like for me going through with the deaf experience is sort of similar to Charlie, Charlie's experiences at times. Um, so I think that her experience of feeling isolated in a mainstream school is a very common experience for deaf people, whether they have a cochlear implant or not. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple questions that are. Well, yeah, <laughs> hold on just a second. Gonna go look for dad. <laughs> they both came in. Um, I know we're just about at seven o'clock. I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna summarize because we have a couple of questions that are circling around the same question. I'm going to summarize that, but I think Sarah has already sort of touched on that. So um, I'm going to just kind of tell her about that question, but I'm going to actually ask one that also came in to me in a direct message um, because I, I personally would like to hear Sarah answer this question. And then I'll, I'll end. So we'll just go a few minutes over. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, I, so I was saying, Sarah, there, there's a couple questions that have come in that are sort of circling around the same question, which is basically like, what can doctors do better? Um, but I do think you've sort of already touched on the answer to that question. So I'm gonna, ins I'm gonna just tell you about that, but I'm gonna actually ask one more question, which is a different question that came in to me as in a direct message. Um, this person, Aling, says, where do you consider people who hear with corrective aids belong? I don't consider myself deaf because I hear, so I don't feel like I belong to the deaf community, but even with hearing aids, I don't hear the way a hearing person hears. Where does that leave someone like me? I've always considered myself hearing impaired, but now I see I shouldn't be using that term for myself. Where do people like me belong? Right, so I think you can label yourself and identify yourself however you choose, Elaine. So I offer that hearing impaired for me doesn't make sense because I think it focuses on what's wrong and impairment, but I am not wanting to speak for you. In general, I think The, the distinction between the deaf world and the hearing world is false, is false. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone with a hearing loss should be part of the whole deaf world. I think that because people try to segregate themselves and separate themselves. If you use hearing aids and a cochlear implant and your sign or whatever, the, everyone's sort of being segregated and put into these silos. And I think it weakens all of us. I think it's better for all of us to be together. So that's just my perspective. I think that for many people, it's taken a long time to get to that place where they might identify themselves as being deaf. And because of that, that can be a hard thing for people to go through. And the way that society, to go back to that, the way that society at large behaves and how uh, they don't understand that. So making that identity identification a scary thing for those of us who want to I grew up with a hearing loss. I understood myself as a failure as a hearing person, and that was it. I did not 
understand till much later that there, I could be a different kind of person than that. And that took a long time to get to. I had to be around other deaf people to get there. So. Thank you. I'm, I, I knew you'd have a wonderful answer to that question. Um, thank you for asking it, Elaine. And um, I think we'll leave it there, even though there are more great questions, but we're already over time. So I thank you so much, Sarah, for, for being with us tonight, for sharing all your wisdom. Um, please buy Sarah's book. This is where you can buy it if you haven't yet read it. It is really, really wonderful. Um, and a, a recording of the, of the event will be shared around um, later this week by email. We hope to see you all next month. We will be hosting uh, poet, dancer, playwright, actor, Mark Bamuthi Joseph, who will speak to us about his work and the role of creativity in social justice, repair, and forgiveness. Um, but Sarah, thank you so much again. Uh, it was such a pleasure to be with you again. It's been too long since I've seen you. Um, and uh, just congratulations on the book and all your great work. And I hope I'll see you in the flesh before too long. Yes, yes, I too. And thank you, Nelly, for inviting me. Thank you, all, everybody, for joining us for this conversation. Yes, thank you for coming, all of you.